Hello and welcome! My name is Meeplus, they, he, she. And today we are looking at and talking about The Sandman, Endless Nights by Neil Gaiman at all published by DC Comics in 2003. While my Vertigo read-through schedule has gone a bit sideways, since finishing up the main run of Sandman last year, it is my goal to continue to pick up two Sandman trades every year until the world ends or I finally catch up. Not sure which is going to happen first, honestly. As usual, this title is recommended by the publisher for mature audiences, content notes for nudity, Lots of sex, misogyny, beheading, suicide, religious abuse, military violence, equating gender with reproductive capacity, harm to animals, rape, and racial slurs. Looking at the creative team, we obviously have writer Neil Gaiman at the heart of things for the full profile of that dude. Check out my initial thoughts review of The Sandman preludes and nocturnes. Digging a bit deeper, letters throughout this volume were done by Todd Klein, who has popped up in my reviews of Sandman, The Swamp Thing, and Constantine, although I didn't really profile him until my review of Swamp Thing volumes 1 and 2. Seeing as this had an almost anthology-like feel, with each artist heading up a single chapter, either by themselves or in pairs, we will take a brief aside for keywords, etc., and then I will talk about each person with comments in their chat. What kinds of keywords came to mind reading this collection? Power, outside time, fantasy, family, adventure, self-discovery, community, expressive, endings, and unnerving. The summary over on WorldCat is, quote, Endless Nights is an original graphic novel written by Neil Gaiman as a follow-up to his Sandman series. This book is divided into seven chapters, each devoted to one of the Endless, a family of brothers and sisters who are physical manifestations of the metaphysical concepts, dream, death, desire, destruction, delirium, despair, and destiny, end quote. Starting with chapter one, the focus is on death, illustrated by P. Craig Russell, who I profiled in my review of Sandman volumes four and five, Seasons of Mist, and Game of You. Russell worked on chapter one with colorist Laverne Kaczynski, who I profiled in my review of John Constantine, Hellblazer, volume one, Original Sins. Unsurprisingly, a lot of people die in this chapter. Some interesting questions are asked and explored about death, but a lot of what stuck with me was just uber-rich people finding extravagant ways to off themselves. Chapter 2 focused on desire and really interrupted my usual flow of reading because I generally read on public transit, but OMG, while there is sex and nudity throughout this collection, this chapter in particular was just Super hot and heavy. This was somewhat explained when I researched the artist for this chapter. A new face to us here on the channel, Milo Manara is an Italian comic book writer and artist. Clicking over to Wikipedia, quote, Milo Manara, after architecture and painting studies, he made his comics debut in 1969, drawing for Genius a Fumetti Nari series of pocketbooks from publisher Furio Venio. In 1970, he illustrated for the magazine Terror, as starting in 1971, drew the erotic series Jolanda de Almaviva, written by Francisco Rubino. During this period, Manara began publishing work in several Franco-Belgian comic magazines. Manara's reputation for producing comics that revolve around elegant, beautiful women caught up in unlikely and fantastical erotic scenarios became solidified with works such as a comic about a device which renders women helplessly aroused and another comic introducing the heroine Myla, honey, and a sweet-smelling body paint which makes the wearer invisible and Candid Camera, featuring the same protagonist in further explicit adventures. Manera's production continued in this direction to explore erotic comics themes with an artistic and storytelling expression in a manner considered unique to Manera. End quote. Ultimately, a fairly straightforward love story with lots of boobies. I must give some credit for at least queer baiting things a bit and adding a dash of gender and sexuality fuckery as well. There's even some men grappling and killing each other in the nude, which is the closest to nudity equity we can get right now, I guess. Chapter 3 is about Dream and felt the most straightforward plot-wise, as Dream takes yet another mortal girlfriend to a party of celestial beings, bouncing back from some light queering of things, said girlfriend, named Kavala explains to Delirium's question, what are you, that I'm, I'm a female. That means I bear the young of my species. I come from a planet called OA. I am, she's cut off, but that is an odd response on uh, several levels. <laughs> 
This chapter was illustrated by Miguelanzo Prado, another new face around here, who is, according to Wikipedia, a Galician comic book creator born in Coruna, Spain. Quote, Prado studied architecture, wrote novels, and painted before his career in comics. He worked for several magazines and wrote Delirious and Fierce Life Chronicles. His best-known comic book is A Streak of Chalk. This is a dreamlike, experimental, impossible story about a man on an island unable to distinguish dream from reality or peasant from past. Prado also did character design for the animated Men in Black, the series in the late 90s. And from what I could tell, this story is a bit of a jump back in time, with a lot of foreshadowing of things that happened in the main series. That said, Dream was much more forgiving, though, and refrained from condemning his girlfriend to hell for slighting him. So that was nice. Chapter 4 is about despair and was perhaps the most abstract chapter, artistically speaking. Spearheaded by Baron Story, who according to Wikipedia was born in Dallas, Texas in 1940, Quote, Baron Story has been a commercial illustrator since the 1960s, and his clients have included major magazines such as Boy's Life, Reader's Digest, and National Geographic. His cover portrait for Time of Howard Hughes and Yitzhak Rabin hang in the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. His giant painting of the South American rainforest hangs in York's American Museum of Natural History and a 1979 rendering of the space shuttle commissioned by NASA. The first official painting ever done of it hangs in the Air and Space Museum on the National Mall. As a book illustrator, he has done cover illustrations for the Franklin Library Classics. Story has also published many comics and graphic novels, including The Merit Slash Say Journals, Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, Endless Nights, Tales from the Edge, number 1 to 10, Baron Story's Watch Magazine, and Life After Black. Several of his students, including Scott McCloud, Peter Cooper, and Dan Brereton, have become leading figures in the graphic novel field. End quote. After reading this chapter, I was not surprised to find out that it was also done in collaboration with Dave McKean, who did a lot of covers for The Sandman and was also profiled in The Sandman, Preludes and Nocturnes. As a more abstract and collage story, I might have misread this, but heads up that it does appear that one of the people whose despair is highlighted is that of an alcoholic priest who appears to be just about to be kicked out of the church due to a false accusation of sexually abusing a female minor which is obviously a harmful way of presenting that sort of thing in fiction as it encourages people to not believe survivors. Also, I think the church's problem is they didn't kick these people out. Chapter 5 focused on delirium, and so was similarly topsy-turvy to Chapter 5, although it was darker than I was necessarily expecting. The gender pendulum has swung back to chaotic, although this also feels more like people with gender outside of the white supremacist binary might be the result of delirium, question mark, which is also not great. The illustrator for this chapter is Bill Sinkowitz, who breaks the mold and was first profiled here in my most recent review of Milestone Returns Static Season 1. Chapter 6 is a destruction and saw a return to a fairly conventional storytelling structure. Art was led by Glenn Fabry, who, according to Wikipedia, is a British comic artist whose, quote, career began in 1985, drawing Slain for 2000 AD with writer Pat Mills. He also worked with Mills on the newspaper strip Scatha in 1987. In 1991, he took over painting the covers of Hellbrazer, then written by Garth Ennis. He has continued his association with Ennis, painting the covers for his Vertigo series Preacher and drawing Ennis written stories in The Authority and Thor. In 2003, he drew a story in Neil Gaiman's Sandman anthology Endless Nights, and in 2005 worked on the comics adaption of Gaiman's TV series slash novel Neverwhere with writer Mike Carey. In 2018, Fabry announced that he had been diagnosed with lung cancer. It was found to be a misdiagnosis in December 2018 and was confirmed to be tuberculosis, which he reported in January 2019 was in remission, end quote. Fabry was assisted by Chris Chakri, working as colorist slash separator. Lacking a Wikipedia page, Chakri's profile on the website formerly known as Twitter is, quote, I'm an artist, comic book colorist, and collage instructor. He slash him, living on Treaty 1 territory, DM me for prints of my work or for usage inquiries, end quote. He is also based out of Winnipeg. And last but not least, we had Chapter 7 about Destiny, a very minimal chapter both textually and artistically. While I didn't feel comfortable showing it on the YouTube, there is a nice page spread of naked people in a distinctly desexualized way that have a lot of body diversity, which is nice. Illustrated by Frank Quietly, which according to Wikipedia is the pen name for Vincent Patrick Daugan, 
a Scottish comic book artist born in 1968. Quote, he is best known for his frequent collaborations with Grant Morrison on titles such as New X-Men, We 3, All-Star Superman, and Batman and Robin, as well as his work with Mark Miller on The Authority and Jupiter's Legacy. Quietly used to design his own hats and clothing, end quote. Thinking about this spin-off slash tie-in graphic novel, I'm not really sure what to make of it. What is its purpose in existing? Did Gaiman perhaps phone this one in? If you like Sam and comics, You'll probably like this one. The problems I take coming from that 2023 perspective, as I always warn, are perhaps a bit less, but the most random and offensive things are still popping up. (laughs) Does this surprise me personally? No, but I certainly do not see that as anything that need apply to anyone else. I'm not really a fan of Gaiman, but in case this is your first time listening to me engaging with his work, I'm also not trying to gotcha fans or pressing for people to cancel him either. The dude seems to be growing and changing over time, which is what appeases the masses. At least that seems to be what I'm learning as I gauge with Vertigo titles. Nothing is perfect, nothing is a universal must-read, and we shouldn't pressure people to read the, quote, classics especially without content warnings. Looking at the kinds of identities I didn't highlight already in the chapters, class, while certainly highlighted, was one of the more abrasive parts of this collection, as a lot of rich and powerful people end up at the center of these stories. The endless included, honestly. Race was not a focus of any of the stories, as far as I could tell, but there was some background diversity. Similarly, ability and disability went largely unexplored, besides some background body diversity, and another despair that is included seems to highlight someone who is having trouble existing under capitalism as a disabled person. By all, keep reading an organized and capitalist oppression. And as always, Literally Graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation. 